and others who will watch the recording later in the week as they and we prepare to be with one another. We take this moment to settle ourselves from all that it has taken to be getting here this morning into the settled energy of being here. We sing our way into presence in this place and presence with one another. Welcome to the circle that we form each and every time we gather. Welcome to Southminster Steinhauer United Church. For those of us joining here in the circle for the first time, or for the first time in a long while, or online, wherever we happen to be, perhaps it's Saskatoon, perhaps it's Toronto, perhaps it's Kelowna, perhaps it's Drayton Valley, perhaps it's anywhere that we have friends and family and people who, who care to join our circle. Welcome. As we gather together, we recognize that we are spiritual explorers. That when we gather, we seek to explore and, and further our journey in some way that perhaps we couldn't if we weren't together in this circle. And so we welcome one another as people of all ages and stages, of all sizes and colors, of all cultures and sexualities and gender expressions, of all religions or traditions, that we're all welcome here in this circle and we're invited to open ourselves to compassion, to deep wisdom, and to knowing that this circle and this experience wouldn't be the same without each of us present here. We meet today on Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to all the fathers uh, present. Uh, it's a day when we recognize the gift of our birth made possible by a father. We honor the fathers in our lives in many ways. We honor our birth fathers, adopted fathers, those who have, without ties of blood, been like fathers to us. For those who express that spirit of care to others, regardless of parentage, for those who express that spirit with children, with animals, with nature, today's a chance to honor that fathering spirit that we recognize. The spirit of caretaker, provider, protector, the sacred masculine in life. We honor the gift of that spirit to make a difference. And in this expansive and embracing way, we share gratitude on this day. As we light our candle, we also respectfully acknowledge our gathering on Treaty 6 territory. That as we approach in June 
the day next Sunday when we will honor National Indigenous Peoples Day. We recognize that we share this land and we honor this land. For the diverse Indigenous people who we share this land with, the Cree, the Blackfoot, the Métis, the Nakota Sioux, the Iroquois, the Dene Ta, and many others whose histories and languages and cultures influence our vibrant communities in so many ways. This light, may it remind us of the light of our new morning that we share together, but also the light of our season, that as we celebrate and move closer and closer to the solstice, to the longest day of the year, that this light be an inspiration to us, a reminder to us that we are lights in our world and that we are born to shine in our time. As we travel this road together, it helps sometimes to sing about this journey we're on. And so let's sing together our journey in this exquisite world. This morning, we're going to have a time for all ages, and I welcome anyone to come to the carpet if they would like. And because this is a time for all ages, we're all going to have a conversation today about conversations. From you, I'll just sit on the carpet too. Uh, when we're talking to each other. Uh, it's, it's not always easy to talk to another person because um, somehow we have to learn when it's our turn. So there's lots of things we have to learn when we're having a conversation. Um, first of all, I want to ask this to anyone in the room. How do you know when the person who's talking is done? Do you have any ideas? Like, do they give you any hints if they're done? There must be some ideas in the room. What are some hints that the person talking is done? When they pause, take a breath. Oh, when they breathe. <laughs> when they breathe. So that's a good idea. But they might just be taking a breath for more talking. 
it's hard to know. What's another way we might know? There's an idea. Oh, when they stop looking at you. That's, that's a good idea. So if they're looking at you and they say something and then they look away or they do something else. Oh yeah, a long break, a pregnant pause. Like yeah, if there's, if they're looking at you like, what do you think? You know, yeah. Oh, if someone asks a question, yes, then then perhaps they're looking for some some someone else to talk. That's a good idea. Someone else had an idea. Oh yes, okay, that's great. Oh yes. Well, we're getting to that. So that when they yawn. Oh yawning. It's the only way you know for sure is when they hit send. Oh good idea. When when they hit send. Yeah. Yes. A big break. If there's silence, you kinda know. Maybe they're done talking. So um so that's one problem, but the other problem is that uh, we have minds and brains that work really fast sometimes. Um, sometimes. Now, I keep getting reminded of this great teaching um, because I'm reminded that sometimes when someone's talking, I'm thinking about what I should say next. Does anyone else ever do that? Yeah? You do? What a relief. Oh, I can't do that. Um, when, when someone is talking, sometimes two things happen in my brain, and I wonder if this happens to you. Um, I'm thinking of something like that that happened to me. Like, I'm thinking of an example. Like, someone tells a story, I'm thinking, oh, I remember when that happened to me, and if I was going to interrupt, which sometimes I do, I would say, oh yeah, like that time when I did that thing. And uh, it's really easy to interrupt because you're thinking of something that you just thought of that they, that they said. The other thing that's really hard is that I'm thinking, if I don't quite like what they said, if I don't quite agree with what they said, I'm already thinking, mm, what's the other side? Like, what, what do I want to say because I don't quite like that, but maybe there's another way to think about it. I'm thinking of about making my argument in my head and how I, could, how I could say that. So, you know what the problem with our brains working like that when someone's talking? If, if our brains are thinking like that, and we're thinking, what's the next thing I'll say, what, what aren't we doing? Yet yeah, we've stopped listening, because we're thinking, what should I say next? What's, what's the next part of this conversation? Or, how will I say what I think? And it means that we've shut off our ears. We're, we're thinking we're not really listening. So this is, this is a great piece of wisdom that we keep getting reminded of again and again in our lives. And we're reminded as kids, we're reminded as adults over and over. If we're listening and we're thinking about what comes next, we're not really listening. So one of the things we can try to do is if someone's talking, to just not only close our lips, but also try to close down that busy part of our mind that wants to think of what we should say. We should just say, hmm, maybe there'll be time later for that. I'll just listen until that person is done. Like when they yawn, <laughs> or they're quiet, or they ask a question, then I have time to think. It means listening will be that much better. Um, the reason I'm talking about listening is because it's so important to understanding each other, and to getting along with each other, and to being good friends, and to being good members of families. To listen is really important. So today, you're here, 
This is fantastic. You're invited to stay in your seats. You're also invited to the activity table that has a few new things on it that you could check out this morning. Might be some fun things to do. And uh, we will carry on together with a song. Thanks for coming. Here we have a, a reading uh, from the Acts of the Apostles, which is uh, a portion of our Christian writings uh, that is very connected with the writing of the, uh, of the book of Luke. Luke and Acts are thought to be by the same, uh, written by the same community. Uh, and same group of authors, and they were a group of writings that spoke to the early Christian community. This is a passage that comes from chapter 11 of the book of Acts. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the words and the teachings of Jesus. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, those ones criticized him, saying, why do you go to all these men and women and eat with these outsiders? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered, what has been made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again into the sky. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were, and the Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. In this story of change, may we find wisdom for our living.
This is an excerpt from a piece of writing from an Irish writer by the name of Claire Mulvaney. Her pieces entitled were Stories and Stardust. And she writes about a recent experience she had campaigning for the yes vote in the recent abortion referendum in Ireland. This is her story of her experience with assumptions. As our canvas for the vote grew closer, my nerves grew too. I was reminded to listen. There is the power of being heard, really heard. As I thought about that, something flipped for me then, and I realized I didn't actually have to talk very much, but instead listen to the no side, to the yes side, to the undecided, to my own fear. And rather than try to impose any view or opinion, what felt more important was to give people space to reflect, to tell their story, to be heard in a safe and open way. What mattered was to show up with a respectful and compassionate heart. This was my chance to practice and be generous with my listening. As we drove the twisting rural roads, I was expecting no all the way from those little villages on the margins of Ireland. It was a glorious sunny evening when we arrived, the sky awash with migratory birds and evening song, the Atlantic waters calm by our side. Couldn't I just sit by the sea instead? My nerves grew stronger as we began the conspicuous walk. The doors awaited. We entered the dark pub. Men's, men in rows drinking dark pints looked up at us and down slowly with great caution. One man by the bar furrowed his bow, brow and kept his eyes low to his pint. I waited to bolt. Just listen, I told my beating heart, and stay open. I took some deep breaths and imagined sending loving thoughts into the hearts of each of those men. I was still scared. An awkward nervousness descended. An old man raised his pint and his eyebrows, and with a gentle nod upward of his head, he finally broke the silence. It's your body. You make a choice. Who are we to stop you? And then another man raised his pint with his approval, and then another and another. All the old men with their pints in this strange village. It was enough to know that I had misjudged the margins. Edges, perimeters, boundaries, borders, peripheries, horizons, thresholds, margins. These are the things that hold interest, making one state of being to another, an us and a them, an inside and an outside. And so often we're led to believe they're fixed, that the boundary marks an end state, that the edge of our comfort zone will always be the edge that we get to grow only to a point that minds are fixed, forever fixed. But nature tells a different story. Back in biology class around 1995, I learned about osmosis, the movement of liquid or gas from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration through a semi-permeable membrane. The cell wall is not a fixed thing but a frontier, a passage between one state of being and another. Through the margin of the wall, the entire chemistry of the cell can be modified. No cell wall is fixed. We are deeper and we get to the subatomic level in any case where we realize that we're all just bundles of bouncing energy in space with plenty of room to maneuver. Nothing, not even something that appears solid, 
is a fixed, permanent state. Not even ourselves. And when we think of ourselves as immutable and irrefutable, we become locked in our own definition of ourselves and constrict it somehow until the world we want to know is the world we already know. In other words, we become small. But ideas are not fixed. We are not solid. Minds can change. Hearts can change too. Men in dark pubs can raise their dark pints and declare that a woman has a right to the margins of her own body. Life at the edge is never as it seems. Osmosis tells us so. I made so many assumptions about the men in that village because sometimes it's easier to make assumptions than it is to listen. And then we don't have to step out of our own comfort zone. How do I know? Let me tell you a story. A long, long time ago, I placed a staunch label of religion around myself. That religion was my world, and in that world, I thought I would belong forever. I felt safe there, and I, I felt understood. But I had so utterly defined myself by that label, that religion, that I fell into the black and white school of thought. It was either this way or the wrong way. You either believed like me or you could be converted to believing like me. I was young and convinced I had the truth, a singular truth. There was no room in me for gray or ambiguity. In fact, I would never have imagined myself to be out canvassing for a yes vote in an abortion referendum. I would not have recognized the me of now, and I can hardly recognize the me of then. What changed me? It was ancient and simple. Stories and love. So I'm wondering now, what if each of us could entertain a different story for a while? One that goes something like this. We are semi-permanent membranes, bouncing around with infinite possibility in space. We are each other. That as much as we are stardust, we are also stories. And that if I disagree with you, I can still respect you and still hold you in a universal understanding that your version of truth is yours and mine is mine. And somewhere in between, we might get to something. If only we could really listen. If only we could climb over our walls. In these reflections on change. We are living in times of deep polarization. If we think about the issues that are part of our public discourse right now, we see dividing lines everywhere. In trade and tariffs, in election campaigns, in support and in opposition to pipelines, in immigration policies and practices, in climate change, in international relations, in political leadership and political parties. Even over the course of this week, we have seen the painful polarization within the LGBTQ2S community between those who supported the protest at the Pride Parade and those who opposed that same action. The rhetoric in all of these matters quickly becomes heated and personal. Discussion and debate are displaced with hostile lines that create communities of us and them, communities of for and against. It's not like any of this is novel territory for us. The issues have been different over our history, but we have been at this same intersection many times. The corner of us and them is a busy intersection we have to navigate over and over again. 
That was the very intersection where the world of the ancient story has these two unlikely characters meet one another, Peter and Cornelius. Peter was a good Jewish boy raised in a good Jewish home with a home with a good Jewish mother, staying in Joppa with a good Jewish family. He's in town to teach a new way to be Jewish. He's become a leader within a sect in first century Judaism that has been compelled by the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. So here's Peter. One of the key organizers of this movement. It's happy hour. He's not having a nip, he's having a nap. He's having a nap before dinner, and he's dreaming of every unkosher thing he can think of. Badgers and buzzards and bats, to name just a few. But in that dream, when he's invited to eat all of those unkosher things, he promises again and again to remain faithful to the lifelong teachings of his tradition and never, never, under any circumstance, to eat these forbidden things. But really, the dream is quick to teach Peter, never say never. The nature of life is change. Anything is possible. Osmosis happens. Of course, Freud would be quick to tell us the dream is not really about what's on the menu. The dream is about who's at the table. It's not about the menu, it's about the guest list. It's not about what he eats, it's about with whom he eats. Peter has spent several transformative years of his life in the company of a radical peasant teacher who was critiqued again and again for his eating habits by the religious leaders of his day. Not for his table manners, but for his table mates. The religious authorities dismissed Jesus as a drunkard and a glutton, not because of what he ate or drank, but with whom he ate and drank with the nobodies and the nuisances, a.k.a. the Gentiles and the women, the thieves and the slum dogs, with that great swath of outcast humanity that the religious leaders like to call, in shorthand, tax collectors and sinners. That means all manner of humanity that wasn't just like them. So after three years or so, you'd think Peter might have developed some different eating habits, some different dinner companions. But he has this peculiar relationship with the number three in his life. And three times he needs to be invited to order the unthinkable from the menu, to get him ready for three strangers that are going to do, invite him to do something utterly unpalatable, to have dinner in a Gentile home. Even worse than that, to have dinner with a Roman officer and his family and friends. In other words, to have dinner with those who are them, those who are the other, those who are not Peter's people. They're not part of his faith. They're not part of his race. They're not part of his world. They're representatives of the enemy empire occupying and oppressing his people. As the story goes, he's barely awake when the knock comes to the door, and of course it was. Three representatives sent from the Roman official who lived up the road in Caesarea. And Cornelius, that Roman officer, had called for Peter because he too had had the strangest dream. So the next day, Peter undertakes the unthinkable. And he goes with these three strangers to that extravagant Roman city. 
that city that embodied everything Roman, the baths, the all-weather port, Caesar's palace, the amphitheater, all things pagan and all things Roman, all things built on the backs of his people, all things that put the empire right smack in his face, all things unclean to an observant first century Jew. He goes to Caesarea to meet Cornelius on his own turf. And he goes into Cornelius' home and the place is packed with every shirt tail relative and all of Cornelius' closest friends. They're waiting for this Jewish man to cross the threshold and tell them about this experience, this movement he's part of, this experience he's had of his teacher and friend. And what this movement he's been leading is all about. And they're waiting. They're poised to listen, to understand. And what's the first thing Peter does? Open mouth, insert foot. What's the first thing he says? Well, you all know I shouldn't be here. It's unlawful for a Jew to visit a Gentile. Didn't he learn anything up there on the roof? Imagine how Cornelius and his guests would have felt. Their honored guest turns out to be this racist, xenophobic guy who walks into their house and treats them like dirt. He might just catch something from being in the same room with Gentiles. And then as the story goes on, then comes the word, we've got to love. But, he says, but means things can change. But means the past doesn't prescribe the future. But means that the things, the way things are, are not the only way things could be. But means things are immutable, not immutable, unchangeable. But, he says, I've had an experience I didn't understand until now. But I'm opening to a new understanding. I'm beginning to see that there is more to see. I'm beginning to see that who was missing from the table. I'm starting to imagine another possibility. I'm starting to understand why our teacher gathered us around tables where we would never have imagined ourselves eating at the most segregated places in first century Jewish world. I'm beginning to see there's enough room in this movement for all of us. But means I'm where I never imagined myself to be. But means I can see myself differently. But means osmosis can happen. But means everything can change if I will listen long enough and hard enough and deeply enough to allow my assumptions to be challenged. Claire Mulvaney would have campaigned for the no vote in the 1983 abortion referendum in Ireland. In 2018, she campaigned for the yes vote. In that space of 25 years, both she and her nation had changed its mind. It's a story about change and where change begins. We know it's easier to make assumptions about each other than it is to listen to each other. That it's much easier to hold ideas and opinions as singular truth than it is to recognize that we need each other because wisdom and truth are always incomplete. And none of us has the whole story. When the others in the early Jewish Christian movement heard what Peter had done, they called him up on the carpet to explain himself. What in the world were you thinking? Surely you can't believe that this Jesus movement is open to Gentiles. 
to Roman Gentiles, to anyone and everyone. What happened to you? We thought you were one of us. When we open ourselves to really listen, everything becomes more complicated. We'll no longer sit comfortably on one side of a line, on one side of a divide. Instead, we'll stand in the middle of that busy intersection not on the comfortable curb of the us corner or the them corner. And things will not be as simple as we thought, and no one will be quite as wrong as we thought they were, and we will not be quite as right as we thought we were. But we will have changed the traffic pattern. The flow of being against one another And we'll have created a meeting place in the middle of it all where the sides give way just like the walls of a cell give way to osmosis. And that's the place where we can plant the seeds that will change a conflict into a conversation. We might not change one another's minds, but surely we will change one another's hearts. And above all, we will change the relationship that we have with one another because we will be changed. We take this time to pause with each other, to think about where it is we find ourselves in that messy, busy intersection where the clean corners of us and them have given way to that messy place where we're listening. We're really listening. Where seeds of change get planted.
This community is made up of such uh, fantastic people who give of their time and their energy and so much of themselves. Uh, people who uh, set up this room and who make coffee for us. People who uh, will grab a broom or a mop at the at, at this first sign of need. Uh, people who contribute school supplies and 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 other things whenever there's a need that is called for um, and of course for those that that give of their energy to to be here and present like we are this morning wherever we are uh, to, to give ourselves to each other there are so many ways that we give uh, to the life of community and all of them are valuable and all of them uh, are reasons for gratitude. So thank you for all the ways that you contribute to the life of this community. Uh, if you uh, would like to uh, contribute this morning, um, there, are, there are many ways to contribute financially. Uh, there's a box at the door that will receive your uh, checks or cash in an envelope. Uh, you can donate online, as always, anytime. Uh, you can also speak to someone at the welcome table about donating uh, through uh, pre-authorized remittance uh, that will come out of your bank every every month. Um, there, there are many there are many ways to give, and uh, we are grateful for all of them and all the ways that you contribute. So thank you. As a way for us uh, to be uh, more fully who we are to be more fully who we want to be and to live uh, more closely as we pray. We, we say words that can strengthen our intentions as we move into this day and in this week. May we speak these words with one another and for each other. As I live every day, I want to be a channel for peace. May I bring love where there is hatred and healing where there is hurt, joy where there is sadness, and hope where there is fear. I pray that I may always try to understand and comfort other people, that I may also seek comfort and understanding from them. Wherever possible, may I choose to be a light in the darkness, a help in times of need, and a caring, honest friend. And may justice, kindness, and peace flow through my heart forever. Amen. We take the wisdom of this time with us to honor the light within each person May we live in ways that nurture and hold light for one another, not in ways that diminish the light of another, but in ways that enhance one another's light. May we learn from each other. May we listen well and listen deeply as we go asking ourselves just one question. What would love do now?